Hello, good evening, and welcome to your most authoritative business analysis show, Business Focus, live here. Uh, on TV3. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. Now, the financial sector cleanup has undoubtedly been rigorous and taken a heavy toll on shareholders, employees, and the banking public as a whole. Now, the 2019 Ghana Banking Survey, conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers Ghana, for instance, noted difficulties of customers as 45% were reeling from panic withdrawals, leading to liquidity challenges. Now, tonight, we discuss the financial sector cleanup with specific focus on foreign direct investment and its impact. Now, we have an exclusive interview with the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Mr. Yofi Grant, uh, coming up shortly. We also have a mover segment where we tell you uh, the struggles and success stories of startups, as well as the very latest tips on technology one can employ to grow their businesses on tech today. This is Business, business Focus. We'll take a short break and return with more. All right, welcome back to your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. This is Business Focus. My name is Parker Tiasari. Well, so the Bank of Ghana recently announced the completion of the financial sector cleanup after the last batch of savings and loans uh, companies had failed to meet their new minimum uh, capital requirements and they had their licenses revoked and the said banks either consolidated, absorbed, downgraded, or dissolved, and that's uh, with re in relation to the set, uh, commercial banks. Now, those who felt unfairly treated have shared their grievances. Some have headed to court, have headed to the courts, whereas others have accepted their fate. Well, the 2019 Ghana Banking Survey, conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers Ghana, for instance, noted difficulties of customers at, as 45% were reeling from panic withdrawals, leading to liquidity challenges. While well, the situation has also reportedly affected investments as seen with the bearish performance of the Ghana Stock Exchange over the past few months. Well, we had an exclusive interview with the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Yofi Grant. We talked about the financial sector cleanup and its impact on foreign direct investment, government's flagship One District One Factory policy, as well as several other issues. Take a listen. 
Thank you. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, you've been chief executive of the GIPC mm. for the last two and a half years. Yes. And uh, how has it been so far? It's been exciting, um, but uh, there have been challenges, but I see those challenges purely as opportunities. Mm. Um, I think that Ghana is in a, a very good space right now. We seem to be in pole position of selling the great African story. Um, and uh, of course, that has been well, should I say, crystallized into Ghana hosting the headquarters of the AFC, FTA, right. which is a big thing. I mean, it's a huge because then it means that Ghana is actually in the driving seat of African investment and trade. Um, and we also recognize that um, with the best of intentions, it's always good to have foreign direct investment because all over the world, from history, no country has been able as an island to make it on its own. It's always the fusion of capital, ideas, new uh, innovations that help a com country accelerate its development. Right. And so we definitely do welcome uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, you asked me how it's been. It's been, I think the future is even more exciting than the past. Mm. I'm sure coming into office, when you assumed office mm -hmm. in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, you had your own, you know, vision and right, milestones. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what would you say you've achieved within the period? Well, I, I think, first of all, um, the visibility of Ghana is not in doubt. Um, whenever we go out now, and I'm sure you've been seeing CNN think that Ghana is a place that you must visit. Um, we've been um, highlighted as the most investor-friendly country in West Africa, getting more FDI than Nigeria, which was another point of contention because Nigerians weren't happy. They're a big nation and they have the resources, so they should have had more. Um, in terms of st uh, political stability, Ghana is seen as the most politically stable, is seen as friendly, um, and we seem to be doing and saying the right things. Even the fact of the year of return resonates very, very loudly in the uh, um, African people of African descent and for the rest of the world, saying that, wow, okay, these guys are now ready to, uh, to rock and roll, to find the, uh, um, um, the words to say. After 62 years, the country is very well positioned to also spearhead the economic and financial renaissance of Africa. And how's that gonna happen? The rhetoric is there. First of all, you have put out a very powerful statement that empowers almost every young African with a Ghana beyond aid and making it Africa beyond aid and from aid to trade. That is a very empower uh, empowering statement. And then secondly, here we are as um, the, the headquarters of African trade and industry, the AFCTA. I mean, that in, in particular repositions you um, because the opportunity of an Africa today is vast. Think of it. By 2050, Africa will be one quarter of the world's population. It will still have 30% of the world's mineral resources. It will still have the biggest crop of world, of the possible world labor of young people because our demography says that we are going to be still about 55% of the population will be less than 35 years old and probably better educated than 30 years ago. So very well positioned to supply the labor force of the world today. Mm. Your predecessor mm -hmm. uh, launched a strong lobby strategy to woo investors on a first international tour. What has been your strategy? Our strategy is, is twofold. First of all, you have to highlight the Ghana brand. People have to hear about Ghana. And not only that, after hearing about Ghana, they need to understand where the government is going and the success we've achieved and then what the potential is for the country to grow and how that potential is going to be exercised through the investment opportunities that we have. Like I said, we are minerals rich, we are land rich, we are relatively people rich. And we are politically stable. We are probably seen as the most friendly in West Africa. We are seen as the most peaceful. So all those things, when you put them together, you package it together, you have a great selling story. And that is what um, has elevated Ghana to where it is. I mean, almost, in fact, indeed, every foreign investor that comes to Ghana comes through here first before they get their business going. So never mind that it's ExxonMobil with their 10 billion project that they're going to do in oil and gas and Aka who's going to do about the same. Um, you have VW that is here coming to assemble cars. Suzuki is looking at the market. Renault is looking at the market. Nissan is looking at the market. Toyota is looking at the market. Uh, Sino truck from China is completing their factory to start assembling plants here. So 
sadly, you're seeing that there's a lot more activity. Mm. Um, and I think GIPC has become much more visible. Mm. We are using a multi-platform strategy to let people know about what we do and what we're doing. Um, so we, apart from traditional media, like we're leveraging talking, on social media as well. We are leveraging very strong on social media. We have a LinkedIn page. We have a, a WhatsApp page. We, we have WhatsApp platforms. We have... Um, Twitter uh, handles that we use. We have a Facebook page. So we are deploying all those because in the marketing, and this is purely a marketing job, you've got to highlight your good, your good parts. Um, and you've got to show the world what you really have. Mm -hmm. And I think that has, um, that has uh, done well. It, it, it involves a lot of travel because you need to go to where the investors are and convince them. And it's not a one-day visit. You, you talked about... Uh investment mm -hmm. within the oil and gas sector. You also mm -hmm. talk about the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in knowing which particular areas of the economy offer the greatest opportunities for uh, foreign investors. You know, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, that one, of, one of the good problems Ghana has as a country is that we have diverse opportunities. But our immediate priorities were energy because we are also changing the structure of the economy changing it from one that was predicated on the export of raw materials and resources. We're sending our cocoa beans out for a raw form. We're just selling the beans. We're selling our bauxite out as, I don't know, as bauxite oil, sorry. Um, and, and we're sending out our Greek products. But that only takes us to the, the lowest level of the value chain in the economies of those uh, products. So government has decided and the president of do that. No, 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 no. We're going to stop this export of raw materials because that doesn't even require, that doesn't even do well for a well qualified, better earning um, economy where you make better money and people get better jobs, better qualifying jobs, better paying jobs is in the value added manufacturing space. So we should transition there using our raw materials and our resources. Is that where the one district, one factory policy comes from? That, that, that is the fundamental base of building an industrial um, nation. And what's been the success of that? Fairly well, fairly good. You know, and I, I dare say that when government said we were, going to, we were going to do one district, one factory, they didn't put a timeline that in two years or four years would have done every district. What they said was they were putting a policy to develop some manufacturing or value addition enterprise in each of the 260 districts. 260. 60. How many have we done so far? Um, so far, I know that there are about 171 companies in the various processes, uh, various, uh, should I say, uh, stages of production. How many are complete? I, I don't have that number at hand, but I know that there's 171. But at least you but, know Nana Kufado has just four years. He has a four-year mandate. Are you saying that within oh, four I'm years sure, you're going to be I, able I, to I, achieve I, I suspect that it, I strongly suspect that it will end up more than four years. But at least he but has are a, they, but, but, institutionally he has a four-year mandate. But, yes. so you grant. In four years, mm. in fact, in two and a half years, what this government has done, Many other governments in eight years have not been able to do it. Like what? Macroeconomic stability, growing. Well, in 2011. Let me uh, let me let me let me tell governor, you. You asked me a question, so let me answer. Please do. You know, this government inherited a, an economy that had significant headwinds. Our debt to GDP was above 70 percent, 73 percent. Our deficit was above nine percent. Interest rates in the mid 30s. Inflation was double digit. Our GDP growth had declined to probably the lowest in 22 years at the end of 2016. And we're under an IMF pro uh, program because we needed the support. In one year, in one year, through fiscal consolidation, better debt management, and significant reforms, the GDP, jumped from, GDP growth jumped from 3.6 or whatever it was to 8.1, one of the fastest growing countries in the world. In addition to oil? But 2016, we had oil. 2015, we had oil. 2014, we had oil. And so if you say if you had oil and your GDP growth is drawing down, then something is wrong. But in one year, that was reversed to one of the fastest growing economies in the world, 8.1%. And you're saying this is due to the remarkable work of the... Absolutely. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. There are foundational issues that had to be sorted out, and they were sorted out. But again, one of the foundational issues... But I haven't finished answering to you. So that was one. Apart from that, debt to GDP was brought down from the 73% into a more sustainable 50 plus. 
interest rates have been brought down from the 30% to the mid-20s and looking lower. In fact, the government paper is 16% mm. from the 30 whatever it was before. Inflation has been brought down from the 15 plus to 7.8% as at last month. Mm. The deficit had been brought down from the 9 plus to somewhere just about 4. Those, and those are insignificant. Apart from those, the government was also able to execute one of its major social programs, the Free Senior High School program, which for me is probably one of the most transformational programs that we could have undertaken ever since independence. Mm. So to say that, it, to it, and that's why I said in, in two and a half years, what has happened in the economy is, is well, breathtaking. Well, all those are macroeconomic right. indicators, which should obviously, ultimately reflect in the lives of the people. You know, seen that you know, when you're building a house, mm. you don't start with the roof. You start with the foundation. You build a solid foundation. And if there were cracks in the foundation before, they've been, they've been fixed. And now they are building. We are building on that. So we've seen FDI um, coming to Ghana increase over the period. In 2017, FDI jumped up from 2.4 billion in the previous year to 4.9. In 2018, it dropped to 3.6. But of course, global FDI also dropped significantly in 2018. Mm. This year, we are targeting um, a significant uh, amount of FDI. And I believe that we will be on track. So back to my question, you suggest... But I haven't even finished. <laughs> Please do. Because we spoke about um, economic growth. And mm. I said in 2017, economy grew by 8.1%. Mm. One of the world leading uh, economic growth countries. In 2018, 6.3%. This year... Even after exiting an IMF program, Ghana's economy is projected to be the fastest growing economy, not only in Africa, but in the world. Now, you can't tell me that happened by accident. I mean, it, it, it's not possible. It's the work that has been done. First, making sure that we have a solid foundation on which to build um, an irreversible and sustainable growth paradigm and growth tra trajectory for the economy. And then transitioning from an economy that is purely um, built on the export of raw materials and resources mm. into one of productivity and value added. Mm. But apart from that, on the social side, certain things have happened that have brought relief. And, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to clearly articulate that. For example, if I'm a business person and my kids were in secondary school, now today, the 2,000 cities that have paid for free senior high school, I'm not going to pay. Inflation has dropped. That is to my benefit. Interest rates have dropped. That is to my benefit. The taxes the, 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 uh, uh, have you calculated per ta par taxes per person? If you, if you, if you look at um, if, uh, uh, those have gone, um, uh, inflation has come down, interest rates have come down, very good for business. In the first year, 17 taxes were re removed because of the nuisance taxes, very good for business. Um, we've created a better value in terms of ease of doing business because we've jumped up six hoops, and I believe this year we might jump up a few more. Mm. That means our business environment is improving. Mm. Um, Ghana, uh, uh, even on the corruption side, it's, it's, it's improved dramatically. Where before, um, what, the, the index showed that we, we seem the perception of corruption was highest uh, in government side, and now it's, it's, it's significantly lessened. So all these things point a certain direction. And maybe for us here, we probably don't see it. But for the person sitting outside objectively mm -hmm. and looking, he says, well, that's a country going places. And that is why Ghana's, the focus on Ghana today has elevated high. So what you're saying is that another mm -hmm. government uh, has achieved a lot within a three-year period. Absolutely. And you're suggesting that by that inference, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot more factories or we will be able to achieve the 260 factories in all the 260 districts within the four years? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying that the policy was put in place, mm. and the factories are starting. Bear in mind, you know, some factories I don't build in a year. Some of them will take 18 months. Mm. It was a huge factory. But before, did you see a VW come to put a, a, a VW wanted to come to Ghana? Did you see an Aka want to come to Ghana? No. Did you see an ExxonMobil want to come to Ghana? Mm. And these positive things, I said about 171 factories so far at least have hit the radar on the various one, stages one. of completion. Yeah, yeah. Right. But they weren't there before. Mm. There they might have been a few. There are more. Mm. So obviously, I mean, tell me yourself, is that not an improvement, a vast improvement on what we inherited? Well, I guess the people of Ghana will... will no, no, I'm asking you. Uh, you are rational. Uh, uh, so I uh, suspect uh, uh, that on the basis of rationality mm. alone, you probably say so. And I'm not saying that's the end of it. Mm. Because there's still a lot more work to do.
Do you know what the, uh, the one district one factory policy will do? What would it do? It will democratize the economy. You have jobs created in every nook and cranny of this country. Mm -hmm. One factory means that you're going to uh, build um, haulage, you're going to do marketing, you're going to get produce for the market, even market women who are at home, who start cooking for people in the factories there. It's all part of the job creation thing. And that's not the only policy. Planting for food and jobs. Over 500,000 farmers, if I, I'm told that over a million farmers have benefited from it. And what has been the result? For the first time, we became a net exporter of maize. We had a glut in plantain. We had a glut in other products. These are all positives. Right. They are si not just positives, mm -hmm. but significant positives. And the important thing now is to build on them to really build a truly industrial economy. Right. I'd like to find out from you what's been the biggest, single biggest challenge uh, investors face uh, when, you know, conducting a project here in Ghana? Well, they are very, depends on where. Um, it depends on where. For some of them, it's the speed of execution. Mm. Um, many of them, they, they like the country, they come in, and they probably don't get things going quickly enough. And that's because maybe we still have a little bit of bureaucracy in, in some of these things. But we are working hard at it. The, the, we have a, a secretary that plays the Ministry of Trade that is looking at the ease of doing business. We're working with um, some of the international agencies to see how we can accelerate um, our business friendliness. And bear in mind, today's world is all about investment. So you're hearing that more and more than ever, FDI. Um, every country is now struggling for FDI. Even China is going out there attracting FDI. Um, the Emirates are attracting FDI. Even the United States looks for foreign direct investment. Mm. So we also need to do what we have to do to make sure that you know we have the foreign direct investment coming this way instead of going to our neighbors. In the recent past, there have mm -hmm. been uh, rumors, or if you like, allegations uh, about the GIP GIPC itself uh, mm -hmm. having, uh, you know, been, let me put the, qu the question this way. There have been rumors of GIPC's favoritism in the granting of tax waivers to companies. How grounded is this? I am not sure that is factual. Um, and of course, usually rumors, rumors uh, are generated around suspicions, et cetera, et cetera. The truth of the matter is that every foreign business person or business that comes into Ghana needs to register through the GIPC. But not every indigenous business needs to register. They may if they so wish. And so when they don't register through us, they don't get the incentives and things that we give. So many of the Ghanaian companies don't even register with GIPC because they, they don't see the need and they go ahead and do what they have to do. But those who come through us do ask for these incentives. Have you given any incentives? Oh, yeah, we have. We are looking at um, construction projects that are um, indigenous, and we are looking at what incentives we can give to them. And how do you ensure value for money in all these projects? Well, you see, most of the people who come here are private investors with their own private money. Um, they, they are coming to do their projects. It's, I mean, if somebody wants to come and build a house in Ghana, and he thinks that he's going to spend more money in building that house that somebody thinks he can be, uh, build less. If it's not government money and the guy wants to put more money in there, all the better for me because it means our workers and things will get more money. So the issue of value for money in that sense um, doesn't relate to us as much as the expenditure of government money um, in projects. Um, when it's a private investor coming to do his project, uh, we look for more. But there's one other issue of local We want more content. investors coming in. Local but it's not content. just foreign direct investors mm. that are of concern to us. Mm. Indigenous di investors. There are indi people, indigenous investors in the economy. Mm. Even Guta, who are a retail group, mm. they invested in the economy. You get me? Mm. There are Ghanaians who legitimately are invested in the economy. Many of them have gotten the incentives they want. Mm. They have gotten the incentives they want. But in because our incentives content, are... Boosting local content, mm -hmm. how have you ensured, particularly as a chief executive of the GIPC, that we have local content being implemented? Well, it depends on which sector, because in some sectors, it's mandated in the law. Mm -hmm. in, our, in our laws, there's no mandatory factor that every um, investor must have local content. Mm -hmm. It's not by law, but we encourage it. And in fact, my experience here is that a lot of the foreign... Even within the oil and gas industry? But that's why I'm saying that it's okay. sector specific. Okay. All right. It's not general. Okay. The GIPC does right. investments generally. Right. So we don't have it in our law that you must have, it's compulsory, mm -hmm. that you must have X percent Ghanaian enterprise or Ghanaian workers in your thing. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, it happens that almost every investor who comes here, after a year or even less, they would rather want Ghanaian workers in their companies than have bring expatriates mm. because it's more expensive for them. And all, the realization is when you have a Ghanaian partner, you are able to negotiate the nuances of the economy much quicker and faster than when you come on your own as a foreign direct investor. Mm. So many of them come. They're big ones. They always want a local partner. They always come in with a, they want a local partner if they don't have one, or they're looking at it. The companies don't want to share, or they think it's a trade secret, that they, they are a bit more careful. But generally, most of this, the people who come here are looking for a local um, partner or want local participation. Mm. You know? And the interesting thing is, for us at GIPC, now when we travel out, we're going out on our missions, and they're quite a number, we take private sector people with us. So they go and do their transactions with the possible investors mm. straight up um, face to face mm. and it's worked very well for us mm. you're an investment banker a lot of experience having mm -hmm. practiced over the years yeah. what has been the impact of the banking crisis on fgis well we, we haven't done the correlation yet because it's early yet to see the impact some some of these things take a while but um speaking to investors they view that as a very positive move because everybody, whether it's a Ghanaian investor or a foreign investor, wants to ensure that we work according to the rule of law and there's stability in the financial sector. And so if, if the central bank is um, um, doing things to bring about stability, uh, then for the investor, that, that augurs well for them. And I have had conversations with big investors who think that that's a very positive thing to have happened because then they can trust the banking sector. Uh, because it's ruled by law, the right things are done and the right things are said. The right capital st uh, structures are put in place. So it's, so far, has been positive. Uh, but of course, we all are also aware of the unfortunate side of it, where many jobs have been lost, etc., etc. And so that is something we need to work at. But generally, a cleanup is always good. And as you know, that is why it's a cleanup, mm. because you want to keep it clean, speak and span. If your home is dirty, you've got to clean it. Otherwise, you, your visitors will come and say good things about you. Mm. But also, you know mm. that uh, often when there are bank runs, um, it has a direct effect on investment because once the, the, the liquidity is not there for the banks to give out to the private sector, who ultimately will invest in the economy, jobs are affected and it ultimately also affects the economic growth. Mm -hmm. Now, for someone like you, from yeah. where you sit, yes. is this something we can recover from quickly? Well, it's early yet to say. Um, it's early yet to say, but trust me, that having a stronger bank is a much more positive platform to have than a bank that is weak and is, is a waiting disaster. Because you might lose all your deposits and a, a lot more people who put money into those banks will lose money. At least at this point in time, with the rescue that happened and Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance supporting it, at least I am told that over 3 million depositors were saved because the government backed their uh, deposits with money, with financing. Now, if that hadn't happened, there was a possibility that we're heading closely to a collapse, a systemic economic collapse, you know. So this is very, it was, it was important that it had to happen. And I, I, in very simple language, if, if you have, you know, a place that is dirty, you need to clean it up. If you have a place that is not well structured, you need to solidify the structure. Mm. You know, so it's important that we do it. And I think that it's as a country, it was uh, um, very important that we had to um, bring um, our banking sector um, into a solid foundation, mm. um, get the stronger banks or the strong banks um, to be solidified, the weaker banks to be assisted. That's why some of them were put together um, and they have the, uh, the guts to assist in cap recapitalizing them. Mm. And some were consolidated into one bank, mm. which would be a stronger bank, which I am told that even after a few months of work, um, either out of good governance or whatever it is, they're in profit. But the important thing is that if there's a problem, we have to fix it. We can't grow the country on a very weak foundation of a poorly structured and weak uh, banking sector. Mm. It, it, it doesn't do well. You mm. have to strengthen the banking sector quite, and go quite, there. Quite apart from direct mm. also, there was a big hit in the capital market, especially mm -hmm. on the stock market, where mm -hmm. the performance hasn't been quite uh, you know, satisfactory uh, from beginning of year to end. How do you explain that also? Well, if you compare it to other markets on the continent, um, then it's not, it's not, it's not anything... Um, significantly worrying because markets usually um, follow a certain trend you know 
Um, and as, as we see interest rates come down, what you'd rather want to see is to see the market growing. But historically, and over some years, the Ghana stock exchange has been one of the best performing in the world, except that it's small. Mm. It's a small market. Mm. Uh, but as it grows and as the economy stabilizes, and macroeconomic stability is very important because it helps business people to predict the future in their businesses and makes them able to plan. When that happens, we will see, you know, uh, we will see that I believe that we'll see the stock exchange grow. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it may, it may have had a few challenges here and there. Currency is still an issue. Um, but the currency issue is, is, is one of structure. Because we are importing a lot relative to what we are exporting, our currency will always be subject to the vagaries of the international commodities market um, and certain flows, um, seasonal flows. So that needs to be strengthened. That can be strengthened when we are industrialized and we are more export driven. Mm. And we are not importing as much as we are exporting. Because when we export a lot, you get more dollars. Mm. Um, you know. mm. And so those are systemic problems that are being solved or mm. being worked at. Mm. Uh, but I, I dare say that the future looks significantly bright. Mm. Did you still maintain that the mm. Akufo led government is business friendly? Absolutely. Absolutely, without a doubt. But I'm sure in, in the last few months you've heard uh, people talk about the fact that th there appears to be a, a witch hunt. We've seen Ghanaian companies being closed down by the government. Oh, which, I didn't know Absolutely. we started witches in the system. Ah. I thought we have become so religious that all the witches have fled. Well, well, but, well, people I actually understand. feel that local businesses should be protected. Well, I, I still believe so. Mm. I still believe that local businesses should be protected. But the right local businesses who are doing things according to the law. If there are companies that break the law, um, obviously you don't expect that um, government will still protect them. But some have equated it to the Nigerian situation where there's been a de deliberate uh, attempt to support and grow somewhere like Dangote, for instance. We don't seem to have one in Ghana. Well, maybe it's not that significant or that obvious. I think that what the government has done is to make it foundational, such that everybody can grow creating a solid foundation, not just for a few people, but for everybody. Is that ever going to be possible? Oh, it is possible. It is possible. Don't think that every country in this world started on a strong footing. It's the things that they did in the economy that rectified the path for the, the countries to grow. Mm. We shouldn't take it for granted. Good governance is critical anywhere. Policies are important anywhere. Depending on the policy you put in, your economy can either flounder or grow. And so far, we've shown that the policies that have been put in over the past two, three years are growing the economy. That is why the IMF can say that Ghana will probably be the fastest growing economy in the world in 2019. It's because of the policy orientation. It's because of the work that has been done at the foundational level. It's because of the build-up on the foundations, the one district, one factory, uh, planting for food and jobs, one village, one dam. Um, even the IPEP programs, where you're giving each district one million to support their infrastructural mm. needs. That's how you grow an economy. So you support and, the same and reforms. And it doesn't happen overnight. So you support the same reforms in the insurance as well as the uh, investment. I, I, I think a strong, stable, and solid financial system is not negotiable. It must be there. It must happen. It doesn't matter if local uh, interests are being, you know, waved aside. The question you're asking me presupposes that if it's the local people, then they should be allowed to break the law. But that can't happen. You wouldn't want that, would you? But if you're asking... Would you want that? Absolutely not. Aha! Uh -huh. So it goes without reason that if, I mean, if, 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 the lo if it's just because it's local... There are other local people in Ghana who are doing very well. So... Mr. You Mr. know that. Uh, there absolutely. are local companies that are very strong. I need to find out for And you doing very well. For someone who's been an investment banker, you know, with a lot of experience within the stock market, mm -hmm. asset management, and all, mm. are you one of those who hold a strong opinion that insurance companies or investment banks should be allowed to recapitalize at every point in time? Well, not necessarily, because mm. it depends on the market. But the banking, the banking sector clearly has had it as, as a rule for as long as we had the banking laws that you want, they want you to be capitalized at a certain level. Now, that is not because of the bank. It's because of depositors' monies that need to be protected. So you must be capitalized at a certain level such that you create a certain reserve that at the time of crisis, you can pay back depositors their money. Right. If that is threatened, then you don't have a bank. But the argument about uh, 
banks and insurance houses mm -hmm. being allowed to open within their own space, categories of banks, mm -hmm. categories of insurance companies, those mm -hmm. who necessarily don't want to take that, that level of risk or investment. No, I don't know any bank that doesn't take deposits. They are not a bank. Uh, do you know of any bank that doesn't take deposits? Or any insurance company that doesn't take premiums? So if, you, once you understand one that, size fits for all. No, there are different levels and different sizes. Mm. There are some are development banks, some are commercial banks, some are investment banks, some are insurance companies, some are life insurance companies, some are general insurance companies. There are different business models. And depending on the business model that you have, then um, you need a certain level of stability that you get through your capitalization. capitalization right. you know, so that is what it is really. But um, yeah, I mean, there are different levels. And I, uh, just to deep, dig deeper into your question, yes, savings and loans companies are sometimes important. Microfinance companies are important because they serve a certain part of the market that is informal. And bear in mind, about, it's, it's estimated that about 85% of our economy is informal small companies. Um, so all these other things serve them. Mm. You know. mm. But I'll jump to a question that you said about local businesses. Right. Trust me, I, I, I'm not sure I've heard any president in Ghana, and I've met a few, I've worked with a few, articulate as much how they are keen to grow Ghanaian enterprise and grow Ghanaian millionaires and billionaires um, in all sectors of the economy. And our president currently articulates that. That we need to grow Ghanaian enterprise, we need to grow Ghanaian businesses. But we have to set the law straight. Because if you don't, then you grow them and then they all collapse. Because they had weak foundations. So the important thing is to, how do you build a solid foundation such that if you want to go into business, you will do your business unencumbered in a straight, clean way and grow your business. But I also believe that... Um, that's my personal belief, mm. though, is that, yeah, sometimes you should pick some winners and push them. Because if you can create five billionaires in Ghana who can create 10, billion, 10 millionaires each, uh, you see that they will create business. And bear in mind, um, governments don't create business. It's mostly the capital of private sector that grows businesses. So, and the more investment you have, the more businesses you have. The more businesses you have, the more jobs you have. The more jobs you create, the more people are working, the more you can get the taxes to fund your, um, your uh, country's um, development. Right. So Maybe there is a direct relationship between all those things. The important mm -hmm. thing is you need to create a business environment that is fair, equitable, and allows people to grow. And you think and currently it, the business environment is fair? Um, it's getting there. It's, it's, there are still a few kinks to be ironed out. Mm. There are still a few bureaucratic barriers that we need to work out. But by and large, um, the reforms that have taken place so far have opened quite a bit of space mm. and uh, created uh, an objective and fair platform. For example, I mean, the paperless port removed a little a, a number of bottlenecks and created um, uh, a, a, a faster way of clearing goods, etc., etc. Now it's gone to the next level where everybody is biometrically registered. You get a Ghana card so that your interaction between government and the citizenry will be based on technology, which is, you seamless. know, yeah, seamless, efficient, and effective. Mm. So we are there. National addressing so that if somebody wants a loan now, we know where the person is. Before it was very difficult. We use landmarks. That palm tree over your house. If by some freak of nature, some straw which come and blow that palm tree, you don't exist anymore. Mm. Or somebody in his anger cuts that tree, you don't exist because right. that was your reference point. Right. So all these things are there gradually building a solid foundation for the growth of the economy. Right. Maybe very finally, I mm -hmm. know you're coming up with your Ghana Club 100 Awards uh, pretty shortly. What's going to be different about this? Yes. Well, I, I think uh, we truly need to find the top 100 Ghanaian companies that represent the hundred of our best. Mm. Um, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge because um, what we've done before uh, was voluntary. So you might go to some of the big boys and they tell you, sorry, we don't want to You're be part interested. because we don't want to submit. But mm. I think that it's important to find the top hundred companies in Ghana. Mm. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, it's critical for our growth. Um, because these are the companies that generate the taxes, that generate the employment, um, above the, the, the parapet of the mass of SMIs and SMEs. And we should identify them and make sure that we understand what they do. But that may not be enough. We also need to look at the small people. Mm -hmm. 
the fastest growing ones, the good growing ones. And, um, and this year, um, in our Youth Entrepreneurship Forum, um, there was actually a pitching session where young people pitch their businesses. The first three winners got cash awards. The first winner, we are actually taking them along with, our, with us on our investment mission so they can get capital for their businesses. But even at that, there were angel investors who decided that the one group, uh, that's an angel investor, decided they were going to capitalize them 100000 each mm. to get their businesses going. You know. And then, of course, um, in support of small businesses, there's National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Plan which was seeded with some money to help incubation and growth of businesses. So that's also happening. There are other plans in the economy existing already, like Maslock, um, like the NYA, like the YEA, all there trying to create a critical mass of more educated, more business-like, and more business-aggressive young people to come into the economy. Because, like I said, it's a private sector that creates jobs. So. And government has clearly, de uh, has clearly declared that um, in this ag ambitious and aggressive growth um, paradigm, the private sector is going to be the major moving force. So whether it's infrastructure, whether it's energy, whether it's agro, agro-processing, tourism, the private sector's input will be key. Uh, for me, for me what is more important now is how can we energize Ghanaians to really take advantage of the opportunities in our economy. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you. Uh, Thank Yopi you. Grant is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Centre. All right, so that was our interview with the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Centre, Mr. Yofi Grant, uh, expressing his views on the impact of the banking crisis on foreign direct investment. He talked about a number of issues within the economy. Uh, and so you can watch that interview uh, on our online stream as well. Uh, you're still watching Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program. Uh, we're going to go for a short break. When we return, we'll bring you our mover segment. And for tonight, my colleague Ebenezer Ejekum has been uh, taking us to Central region and speaking to uh, people within the renewable energy space. My journey has taken me to the central regional capital of Cape Coast where I'm looking for some young entrepreneurs to talk to. I'm Eben Ejekumbuati and welcome to the mover segment on Business Focus. My the search has taken me to North Ola in the Cape Coast metropolis and I will be talking to Smila Abubakar, Technical Director of Solid Home Appliances. Welcome to the mover segment on Business Focus. Thank you. Solid Home Appliances Limited is into renewable energy. The company is into the manufacturing of rechargeable generators, fishing gear, LED electric bulbs and other solar powered systems. This is a solar charged mobile generator. Mm -hmm. It can be taken anywhere, it can be put in your car, it can be put in your bedroom, wherever. It's silent, that is why people call it silent generator. And a thousand watts generator, that uses solar to charge. I thought that this one would charge only a couple of bulbs, just no, no. two bulbs and you are done. No, 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 no. You can use it for your television set, you can use it for fun, you can use it for even uh, 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 freezers, you can use it for... On the only thing we are not recommending is air conditioning, apart from air conditioning. Why, why not air conditioning? Because air conditioning starts from 2.5 horsepower and then uh, this, the capacity of this one is not up to the 2.5 horsepower. So that anything we are below the 2.5 Anything 2 .5 below the 2.5 can, uh, can How long this. can this last? It can last. It, it can last forever, so far as you have, you have the charging system. Um, show me how how you, you do uh, the recharge. You, you just you have this generator. You just have to put this one into this slot. I'm holding it. Yeah, it will yeah, 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 me, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it will not do anything to you. Okay. No harm at all. Okay. So immediately it's put inside this one. You can see that it's charging. The system is charging. The reason why we add this one to it is that we don't want the system to run down of power. So this one will help you to restore the power. It's, it's a, it's a multi-purpose generator. What is happening is that if you are using it as a UPS for your computer, your 10 or more computers, you have to just put um, this one inside your plug, just like you are using the normal, the normal UPS, mm -hmm. and then you plug it. It takes only 10 minutes to to charge it fully. Smile Abubakar studied technical engineering at the Cape Coast Technical University and his expertise come in handy. Solid Home Appliances Limited has been manufacturing in Cape Coast for almost 10 months now. One of their inventions is the fish finder. 
what we locally call fishernam special. If all the fishermen are using this, there will be no need for them to closing the sea for one month before they reopen again so for you, the fish. You, you locate you locate the you, best catch. You see you see the fish. Whether they are small whether or big. Whether they are small or big. So if they are small, you just bypass them and then you you, you find the bigger ones and then you you, you, okay. you, you catch. Okay. You're still watching the mover segment on business focus coming to you from the Cape Coast Metropolis. I'm Eben Ejekumbuatin. There are five other technicians as employees who helped to bring to life the concepts that are developed. I was fascinated by the types of electric bulbs that have been manufactured here in Cape Coast by the startup. That one is the magic one. People call it the, the, the emergency. emergency. Yes, it's, it's emergency bulbs. And that one, uh, when, the light, when the main light goes off, you have, you have your light for approximately 12 hours. And this is the demonstration. Um, you, Do you have a electric power in you? I don't have any electric oh. power in me, but I want to let show me, you. Let me try it. Uh, yeah, try it. I want to show you what this bulb can do. Yeah. So you touch the top the, here. The, that, that's it. Then the, the, it, it comes. But you use it as normal bulb. You put it inside your lamp holder and then you use it as normal bulb. When the light goes so off. You can take it out. No, you, you, no, no not even necessarily uh, taking it out. Light you, out there. You, yeah, you just off your switch. You on it again and you have your light for approximately 12 hours. This bulb and lamp are insecticides. They attract insects and kill them. The mosquitoes will be in there. Will be, will in, be, there. Trapped in, will be there. trapped in there. So what you have to do is to remove your bulb from your lamp holder, open it, throw and clean it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and, and this it. one, this this is this is plastic. So after cleaning, you have to uh, fix it back. Uh, so just snap it in. That's it. That's okay. it. You have okay. your bulb. Packaging is essential for branding, marketing, and sales. This startup's packaging orientation connotes production in Africa by Africans and for Africa. What are the challenges that you are facing the, as, as a startup? Our main problem now is investor. How much share do you want to give for somebody to invest? Maybe 10%, 20%? Maybe twenty percent will do, but it depends also on the amount that the person is going to invest. This is a homegrown um Firm, so to speak. Yeah. Are you contacting the Cape Coast Municipal Assembly to to give you contracts? To, because I know government is the biggest buyer of of materials in the country. What you are saying is true. Um, we are in touch with them. They're, they're both the Metropolitan Assembly and then the Coordinating yeah. Council. Uh, we are in touch with them. They, they are assisting. They want to scale up and transform the company into a school. Practical Institute of Renewable Energy. Mr. Smile Abubakar, thank you so thank much you, for sir. having us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, too, right. thank you. Well, from Cape Coast, and that's it for the Mover segment on Business Focus. I'm Eben Ejekumbuatin. Keep watching Business Focus. Right, Eben, thank you very much for the Mover segment. Uh, you're still watching uh, Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. Well, so. Are some African lecturers and professors trading grades for sex? Well, BBC Africa Eye has released a shocking video about the heinous acts of some professors and lecturers in Ghana and other parts of Africa caught secretly on camera. You definitely can't miss the full video exclusively tonight on TV3. Watch Sex for Grades, a BBC Africa Eye documentary exclusively on TV3 tonight at 10.30 p.m. Keep watching TV3 First in News, Best Entertainment. Well, that's all for Business Focus. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Parkus Yassari. For more news, you can log on to our website, www www.3news.com